Great. Thank you for joining this uh, afternoon. Really lovely to see both of you here. Um, what we're going to be talking about today, we're going to be covering uh, topics in immigration and naturalization. Um, we'll have an opportunity for questions at the end. Um, I'll just briefly uh, introduce myself. I'm Kayla. I work with the International Rescue Committee. Um, we're a nonprofit organization in Northern California and uh, the world, but locally we have offices in uh, San Jose, Oakland, Sacramento, and Sherlock. Uh, the information that we're going to be sharing today in the presentation is meant to be educational. It shouldn't be considered legal advice. I'm not an accredited legal representative, which means I can't provide you with specific uh, advice in your case. I can provide general information, point you in the right direction, get you resources, um, but I wouldn't be able to answer, you know, case specific questions as that would fall under legal advice, um, just so that you're aware when question time may come. So the organization of the presentation, we're going to start with talking about what are your rights and responsibilities in the U.S. Um, everybody in the U.S. has rights, so we're going to go into a sort of details about that. We'll talk also a bit about DACA status um, and avoiding immigration scams uh, and also more in-depth conversation about naturalization and then, as I say, uh, questions as well. Uh, so who are we? The IRC, I mentioned we're a nonprofit organization. We were founded in 1933 um, by the request of Albert Einstein, who was actually himself a refugee. Uh, the organization, now we work in over 40 countries and in the U.S. and 23 U.S. cities. Um, we're recognized by the Department of Justice to provide immigration and naturalization legal services. So we're not a government agency. We work directly for our clients. Um, so you can feel confident if you have questions um, that that's all kept uh, within our organization. We provide assistance with the naturalization application, adjustments of status, so the green card application, uh, DACA renewals, consultations for DACA, uh, family petitions, uh, immigrant visas, employment authorization, uh, fiance petitions, non-immigrant visa applications, lots of others. If you lose your green card, we can help you to replace that. So many other types of immigration applications I just listed out, the most common ones that we do see. Um, and assist with at our office. Okay, so moving into, you know, what your rights are and responsibilities in the U.S. I mentioned that everybody in the U.S. has rights, no matter what their immigration status uh, is. Everybody has the right to freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the right to remain silent, the right to an attorney, and due process. We're going to dive more deeply into uh, how these uh, play into your immigration uh, specific rights, so uh, your rights when it comes to dealing with the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. It's the responsibility of everyone who is living in the U.S., who's present in the U.S., to follow the laws um, in the United States, so to know them and to follow them. Uh, and to respect the rights and beliefs of others in the United States. It's also required, if, if you are required, to pay taxes and file an income tax return, again, if required. If living in the U.S., uh, documented or undocumented, but not visitors, um, and male between the age of 18 and 25 years old, um, you would register for the uh, selective service. This is sort of the military draft. It's not been something which uh, has been called upon these individuals to serve, but if required, that's one of the responsibilities of being in the U.S. Uh, immigrants are required to submit a change of address form um, to the immigration uh, services, so the USCIS. Uh, these reports of new addresses have to happen anytime that you move and sort of within 10 days of that move. 
you can file an AR11 online um, or when updating your online account that also uh, alerts them. This is only for the Immigration and Customs services. Um, it's not for, like, if you go to the DMV and you update your address there, they don't share information, so you would have to do these things separately. We want to put out there, this looks kind of scary, but, you know, kind of uh, warnings for people who are not citizens in the U.S. There are sort of different requirements, different responsibilities. Um, Non-citizens in the U.S. should not vote or register to vote. Non-citizens should not serve on a jury or travel outside the U.S. for longer than six months, although there are exceptions to that. Um, so we're talking typically about someone who is a lawful permanent resident. Um, lawful permanent residents do need to show that their lives are here in the U.S. Um, and when you when uh, LPRs or green card holders take long trips, anything over six months outside the U.S. where they don't return at all, that can bring up some questions um, and concerns uh, for coming back into the U.S. and um, sort of various other immigration procedures. So just note that obviously if you are a lawful permanent resident, travel of more than six months where you don't return at all to the U.S. is something to you know get advice about before you leave. Of course, criminal convictions can always impact immigration status, even if they seem really minor. And so if you do have something that's in your mind that you're wondering about, as I mentioned, I'm not a legal representative, so I can't answer questions about whether this specific thing will affect a case that you might want to file. Um, but we would encourage you to talk to an immigration um, expert, get advice, talk to an immigration attorney, talk to an immigration DOJ accredited rep. Um, IRC does have consultations for this, legal consultations. I'll link to our website if you wanted to get legal advice, um, you can check that out. Or if you're looking, I can also give you uh, referrals to any other organizations um, and as you may need for any particular type. So we'll again leave that for the end. Okay, so diving in, like I said, to talk about rights in the US specific to immigration and customs enforcement. Um, and that reminding you again, that no matter what our immigration status is in the US, we all have rights um, in the United States. Certain people are at a more heightened risk of arrest or negative contact with the immigration and customs enforcement and therefore should pay you know, even closer attention that it is relevant to everyone. Um, anyone who's in the U.S. without lawful immigration status uh, or people who do have immigration status, like lawful permanent residency, refugee status, visa, um, but who have certain criminal convictions in their background are at a more heightened risk of negative contact with ICE or possible arrest by ICE. So if you were to be approached by ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, you have the right to remain silent. You can refuse to speak to an ICE agent, and you would do this by simply saying, I want to remain silent. You would, I would encourage you to remain calm, not to run as that can escalate situations. And if you're not feeling comfortable about speaking these rights, saying it because that can be a really intimidating situation. An ICE agent, they look like police officers. Uh, they're sort of the, quotes, immigration police. It can be very intimidating. If you want, you could print and carry a red card with you. Um, these essentially have your rights written out on there and you can hand that or show that to an officer and enact your rights that way. And so it's in brief, it says what it says here, which is, I do not wish to speak with you, answer your questions, et cetera, and you're choosing to exercise your constitutional rights. Sometimes if you were to be approached by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, they're asking for you to show your immigration documents. It's not required for you to do so, but if you have valid legal immigration documents, like you have a green card, it's valid, there's no issue, um, it might be a good idea to show that. Um, again, you're not required to, but you can show those if you're asked. But it's very important not to provide any 
false documents, any documents which are not real. And that of course can only make the situation worse. Everyone also has the right to not have their home searched without a warrant. So if ICE were to come to your home, knock on your door, remember that they cannot search your home without a warrant. You don't even have to open the door unless you see that they do have a valid warrant. And there's a few ways to check that. You can ask the officer to slip the warrant under the door, hold it up to the window so that you can inspect it and see if it has all the correct information. First of all, you wanna see if it's signed by a judge. Any warrants which are not signed aren't valid. Um, and it also needs to, if it's a search warrant, have your address on it. And if it's an arrest warrant, it needs to have the name of someone who's living at that address. So the arrest for someone who's living at that address. If it doesn't have a signature, and depending on whether it's a search warrant or an arrest warrant, it doesn't have the right information. You don't need to open the door, um, even if they show you a piece of paper that looks like a warrant. Sometimes we've known that they do fill out documents where they haven't been signed by a judge or they're not complete um, or they're not accurate. And they show those uh, hoping that the person won't take a close look um, and just open the door. So do make sure to take a moment not open the door until you're able to take a closer look at that warrant. Everyone in the US also has the right to an attorney if they're detained or arrested by police or ICE. Um, you can ask to speak to a lawyer or an attorney and you do not need to sign anything um, before speaking with a lawyer. Lawyer and attorney mean the same thing. We get that question kind of often. Um, if you're arrested by police, say for not an immigration offense, but for like a suspected criminal offense, um, you can request a government lawyer. So a lawyer that's paid for by the US government. But if you're arrested by ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, they're not required to provide you a lawyer themselves that's paid for, but you can of course request an attorney and it's really a good idea to have the name and number of an attorney memorized that you trust so that if you needed to, you could call that person. Um, they could provide a resource list of attorneys, but really it's important not to rely on them for that um, and to have someone that you trust. If they're asking questions, while uh, detained or arrested, do not lie. That seems pretty straightforward, but they can be very intimidating circumstances and you might wanna give them the answer you think that they want to hear, um, but lying can only hurt you in the future and you don't need to share information because you have that right to silence. You don't need to answer questions. You don't need to show documents. Um, you don't have to say where you were born, what your immigration status is, your criminal record. You can choose to remain silent. And so really the two phrases that can protect you in a situation where you've been um, you know, arrested or detained by police or ICE are, I want to remain silent and I want to talk to a lawyer. If you say those two things, they should stop questioning you after that. Now, we also want to talk about avoiding immigration scams. Um, unfortunately, there are uh, many common immigration scams that we do see. Um, one important thing to note is that notaries and notary publics in the U.S. are not attorneys and cannot give legal advice in the U.S. Only attorneys or accredited representatives that work for so accredited representatives that work for a nonprofit or attorneys that work for a nonprofit or attorneys that work for themselves um, can answer immigration questions and provide immigration legal advice. Um, attorneys, lawyers must have a license to practice law. You can ask to see their license. Um, you can look that up online as well. In California, you can look up the California bar. 
accredited representatives have to be uh, trained and they need to work for an agency recognized by the Board of Immigration Appeals. Um, and so you can ask to see their accreditation documents and to uh, you can look up their organization on the Board of Immigration Appeals DOJ website. Um, so IRC has both attorneys and accredited representatives and we are a recognized organization by the Board of Immigration Appeals. Now, also very important that you should never sign any applications with false information, no matter what anyone may say. Um, it needs to be true and correct information to the best of your knowledge and don't sign if there is any false information. Also never sign a blank form. You obviously don't know what's being written on there. It's very important you sign only after you confirm that everything in there is true and correct. Everything that you sign or, um, or file, you should get copies of. And if you're unsure, you can always get a second opinion for any kind of immigration application. There are many nonprofits operating in the South Bay. Um, we often all work together a lot. We know each other. So there are very uh, reputable nonprofits that you can get, um, you know, free or low cost immigration information from if you're unsure whether the advice that you've gotten is correct. Um, particularly, this is important when the advice that you've gotten may seem too good to be true. So if you're talking to someone and you're not sure whether they're, you know, a legitimate source, um, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, get that second opinion and determine whether it really is too good to be true. Uh, as I mentioned, we IRC does have immigration legal consultations. We have an online booking website that you can choose any of our four offices in Northern California um, to book a consultation with, as those are all virtual right now. Um, you can choose where you would like to go uh, or whichever one has the most upcoming uh, consultation appointments. In Santa Clara County, we also want to let you know that from the county itself, there are many resources available for immigrants for housing, baby essentials, food assistance, health insurance, mental health, homelessness, many other things. Um, this presentation uh, has links here so we can send this around to you with the county resource guide for immigrants. You can also search that online. Um, and it has really good information about all of the different you know, programs uh, and resources available in Santa Clara County specifically, um, and housing assistance, basic needs support. So really good links there if you are in need and you are curious about what is available in Santa Clara County itself. Uh, so just quickly, we have our poll um, in the chat, if you can type yes or no, just giving us uh, an idea of whether you have a little bit more information about your rights, and then we'll move on to talking about uh, other immigration options and then uh, questions at the end. But I'll pause here just if you can give us a little bit of feedback. If that was uh, something that you have a little more information about, type yes. If not, you can type no. No worries either way. Just helps us to learn. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we're sort of going to move in. <clears throat> Sorry, for not my throat. Um, to talking about uh, what things have changed with the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, uh, also known as DACA. So, starting from the basics, what is it? Uh, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals is a discretionary policy um, announced way back August 15th, 2012, by the Obama administration, it essentially provides a temporary protection from deportation and an employment authorization for eligible individuals for two years, then it's renewable. Uh, it also grants access to a driver's license. And during the time where the individual has the deferred action, they don't accrue unlawful presence. They're not continuing to uh, sort of have their immigration circumstances get more difficult um, as a result of that. But 
it doesn't provide any legal status to an individual and it doesn't provide them a path to legal status. So it's a very weird program in that it's saying essentially um, you're not here legally and you're not here illegally. You're sort of in this state of in between, you know, lawful status. Um, and it's very, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great program, but it's very difficult because it's never been able to provide a, a long-term solution um, or a path for individuals to achieve that lawful status, which um, they want. Currently, DACA is still in effect. Um, there have been ongoing legal challenges recently. Um, a decision coming down essentially saying that uh, affirming what we had already been uh, doing, what we already knew, which is that renewals of the program are allowed, but no new initial applications are um, accepted at this time. Um, so we continue to give the advice that if anyone is traveling with advanced parole, with permission through the DACA program, um, they should return to the US as soon as possible, given that the program is in such an unsecure status um, and anything could really change with these sort of ongoing legal challenges that will likely continue. For the DACA renewal, which again is still accepted, um, although initials are not accepted, renewals of individuals who already have DACA are continuing to be accepted. Uh, those should be sub, um, submitted between 120 and 150 days prior to the DACA expiration. If the renewal is submitted less than that, applicants do run the risk of having a gap between the old deferred action status and the renewal, which um, you know is not is not good. For people who have DACA status, we want to remind you to keep copies of your employment authorization document (EAD). The front and the back, social security card, your ID. This is good for everyone. Keep originals of your documents in a safe place um, and make sure that you've got copies you know, of that with you. Um, and replacing a DACA card, of course, if lost, would mean to pay the 600, uh, sorry, $465 fee again, um, even if it's just replacing something which was lost, unfortunately. Uh, if you lose your DACA wa uh, work permit, um, you can apply for the replacement pay the fee. It doesn't mean that you're losing the status. This is the same thing that goes for a green card. If you've got a green card and you lose that, it doesn't mean that you've lost your status. So losing the card is just a representation of your status. It's not actually your status. So should you lose that, of course, you need to renew that uh, or sorry, apply for a replacement. Um, but it doesn't mean that you sort of lose your immigration status uh, as a result. Uh, for DACA uh, recipients, the EAD can be used as an ID, but it's not the same thing as a passport or a social security card in the US. Okay, so moving on, talking about now citizenship, the process of applying for naturalization. First of all, what is it? Naturalization is the process that a lawful permanent resident, also known as a green card holder or LPR, goes through in order to obtain their certificate of naturalization, which confirms them as a U.S. citizen. In order to apply, uh, individuals need to be lawfully permanent resident in the U.S. for at least five years, or if married to a U.S. citizen, there's a benefit that uh, they can apply earlier at three years uh, of lawful permanent residency, provided that um, all other qualifications are met. So for instance, that the person you're married to has been a citizen for all three years, um, that you've been married for the full three years, and that uh, that person uh, you've been living with that person for those full three years. So there's kind of other qualifications that go in there and it's very important to get every detail correct. They do also know that uh, applicants are not going to get their citizenship in just a few months. The process takes longer than that. Um, oftentimes we're seeing over a year for the process. So they actually do a let 
uh, applicants apply at four years and nine months of lawful permanent residency, or again, if married to a citizen and, and otherwise qualifying, so meeting all the other um, requirements of married for three years, living together for three years, been a citizen for all three years, you can apply at two years and nine months of lawful permanent residency. Applicants also need to be at least 18 years old, speak, read, and write English. It's not Shakespearean English. It's not perfect English. Uh, they do want to see that individuals can have a conversation and answer questions about their application in English. And there are exceptions, automatic ones. If an applicant is 50 years old or older, and they've had the green card for at least 20 years, they do not need to take the English exam and they can bring an interpreter with them to their interview for naturalization. And the same thing is true for individuals who are 55 years old or older and they've had their green card for at least 15 years. They don't need to take the English exam and they can bring an interpreter with them as well. And those are automatic exceptions. Um, in the application itself, it asks about qualifying for that. And the same thing is uh, true. Or I'll, well, one of the other requirements is that uh, everyone must pass the US history and government exam. We'll talk a bit more about that. But there is also another exception for the history and government exam where an applicant is 65 years old or older and they've had the green card for 20 years. They not only get the English exception automatically and can bring an interpreter, they also get the easier version of the civics exam. And it's easier because there are less questions to study and they're considered to be the more straightforward questions. Um, applicants must also maintain their continuous US residency. So I mentioned at the beginning that taking long trips outside of the US for six months or more uh, can be a red flag, can be a concern for uh, lawful permanent resident status. And also they're looking at that uh, at the time of naturalization. So that's what they're talking about when they say maintain that continuous US residency, where there's been a trip of six months or more outside the US not having returned at all. Um, it sort of brings up a red flag for any breaks in continuous residency. Um, and so this would be something that if you did have that, you have a long trip, maybe there's a reason, maybe there, maybe you had a travel document, maybe there are other circumstances. So it's not a guarantee that uh, an applicant is not eligible if they've had those long trips, but it does for us as an organization I mean we want to look closer at that application. Um, and so for individuals, we would always suggest that they do speak with someone more in depth about their case, a legal uh, representative. You can come to our free workshops um, and get advice on uh, whether a long trip outside the U.S. you know, would affect your application or not. Applicants also need to live in the state where they're applying for at least three months prior to applying and show that they have been physically present in the US for at least half of the last five years. Uh, so this is a little different from taking a long trip outside the US. This is where someone may be taking two or three week trips or a month long trip, and then they come back and then they travel again for another month or two months and they come back and travel again. And they wanna see that over time um, within the past five years that at least half of that time has been spent in the US. So maybe there's never been a long gap um, where someone's been gone for six months or more, but there's lots of smaller trips um, that add, add up to, you know, um, potentially a long, too long of a time outside the US. So that's just a matter of gathering all the information about trips and seeing in the last five years and seeing whether you meet that qualification. Lastly, applicants need to be willing to take an oath of allegiance to the US and demonstrate good moral character. So this is where criminal background comes in. Um, many other things also fall under good moral character though, beyond just criminal background. So things like not paying 
taxes on time, uh, we're not paying taxes at all uh, when required to do so. Many, many other things do fall under good moral character. And so if you're unsure, something's popping into your head, again, you can definitely make an appointment with us at one of our free workshops and get advice uh, on that. Now, there are many advantages to naturalization. Uh, we want to encourage uh, everyone who is eligible to consider uh, con consider applying and think about these uh, in the context of uh, a naturalization application. So citizens do have the right to vote in the US. Uh, they can travel with a US passport, which uh, can of course make coming back into the US easier. There's no concern over having spent too much time outside of the US uh, and not being able to return. Uh, US citizens can also petition for more relatives to come live in the US. So uh, green card holders can only petition for their spouse and unmarried children to come live with them in the US. But once uh, you become a citizen, those options open up. Citizens can petition for their spouse, their children who are married and unmarried, uh, their parents and their siblings. That said, the sibling category is a very long wait time, um, but once you become a citizen, you can kind of start the ball rolling on that and file the application uh, and begin the wait period, although again, it is very long. U.S. citizenship transmits to children who are under the age of 18 when their parent naturalizes, if they're living with them in their legal and physical custody. Citizens also don't need to worry about deportation, um, and so they have that peace of mind to know that no matter what changes may happen in immigration law, uh, they can't be deported and are not subject to immigration law at all. And so therefore also not required to report changes of address or file more applications uh, in the future, et cetera. Job opportunities also expand. There are some jobs which are limited to just U.S. citizens um, to be able to apply to many federal jobs. Um, for instance, in some places, firefighters, police officers, depends on where you live, um, may be limited to uh, just citizens of the U.S. to apply. Uh, citizens also have access to U.S. government assistance abroad through the embassies and consulates that are there uh, all throughout the world, um, you know, to uh, provide services to U.S. citizens in need abroad. Okay, so what happens at the interview? When you file for your N-400, um, it is, of course, quite a long time to wait for your interview these days. I mentioned that the process is often taking up to and possibly over a year to complete. Uh, and that's from the time that an individual applies and when they get their, uh, they go to their oath ceremony and get their certificate of naturalization. Uh, the uh, interview is usually, of course, at the far later half of that wait period. Um, and so we see, you know, again, potentially a year that individuals may be waiting for their interview. But at the time of the interview, they want to review the information that's in the N-400, which could have obviously been submitted well over a year ago. So it's a good idea to have copies of that information at your home. You can't bring it with you to your interview, but you can have it at your home. Review that before you go to the uh, to the interview. If anything has changed, make notes for yourself that you can mention that to the officer. If there were trips that you took in between the time when you filed your N-400 and when you go for the interview, you can let them know about that and any other changes. While the officer is discussing the N-400 with the applicant, they're conducting an informal speaking test to determine if that person is able to, you know, converse and understand questions and answer questions about their application. So it's not part of the formal English test, but it's a more informal um, uh, conversational understanding of English. There is, of course, the formal reading and writing tests. Uh, 
applicants need to correctly read one of three sentences in English. Uh, it's taken from a vocabulary list that is provided online by USCIS. So that's accessible to see all of the vocabulary and study it in advance. The same thing is true for the writing test. Applicants need to correctly write one of three sentences in English the vocabulary, again, all taken from a list provided online by USCIS. And you can see that you can still miss a couple of sentences, get them wrong, and still possibly pass. The US history and government exam, there's 100 possible questions. They don't ask all 100 during the interview, uh, but they do pull at random 10 of those questions and they uh, want to see that the applicant gets at least six of those 10 questions correct in English. Um, and again, 100 possible questions, all the questions and answers are provided online um, and accessible from USCIS. So it really is just a matter of studying, but it is something that people get quite nervous about, understandably, um, but it's very possible to pass with studying for this. Um, they even, I think, have flashcards online that um, can be printed out and used to study that way. Right now, the version of the test that anyone applying today would take is the 2008 version of the civics test. That's where I mentioned those 100 possible questions, but it may change. So if you attend this presentation today and then maybe you know, next year or six months from now you're applying, it's possible that the civics test will change. We know that USCIS is looking into changing the civics test. They tried to change it for a few months uh, several years ago, and then they changed back to the 2008 version. Um, but we can see from that, and we do know that they are wanting to change it. And so uh, we just don't know exactly the timeline, but do note that right now, if you're applying, you would take the 2008 version of the civics test um, with 100 possible questions. We think that they will likely increase the number of questions. Um, that are being asked, um, and those uh, and and those questions will change as well. All of the study guides and test materials can be found linked here. Uh, if you are taking the interview in English, you don't qualify for the automatic exceptions, um, and and otherwise don't qualify for any exceptions through you know a medical or uh, disability issue, for instance, such as Alzheimer's dementia. Um, we would encourage you to study the questions in English to get familiar with uh, them being asked in English and answered. There are multilingual resources available on USCIS's website. If you do qualify for the automatic exception, you can study in the language you feel comfortable in. Or if you're just getting started and you want to take a look at the questions, you feel more comfortable looking at them in another language, you can do that here as well. Now, after the interview, USCIS will either grant, deny, or continue the naturalization application. If it's granted, that's the best outcome. The applicant would attend their naturalization oath ceremony, take the oath, um, give their green card, and get their certificate of naturalization um, in return. And that's such a nice moment because it really is the sort of culmination of someone's immigration journey. They no longer need to apply for any immigration you know, documents. They don't need to be worried about immigration at all. Uh, they finally have that citizenship and it's theirs. It's something which will be theirs for life. It can't be taken away from them. So there's a lot of benefits, really like good moment um, to attend attend that naturalization ceremony. And of course, for an applicant, it's required to attend the naturalization oath ceremony to uh, get their certificate of naturalization. If an applicant is denied, they're going to receive notice explaining why, what grounds um, of the law were they denied under. Uh, applicants have the option to request a hearing, petition for a new review of their application, or potentially even to apply again with supporting evidence. But whether that's a good idea or there should be a wait time or other circumstances that need to be evaluated following a denial is something to discuss with a legal representative. Um, I know I said that a lot, but it is super important um, where you're not sure. And even where you feel sure, getting a second look at your application um, and getting advice is never a bad thing. 
Sometimes USCIS will put the case on hold, essentially, pending information. So it's called being continued. Uh, usually this is where someone didn't pass the U.S. history and government exam or the uh, English exam, and they're being given a chance to come back and try again within 90 days. Um, maybe sometimes they also want to see additional documents or information based on something that came up during the interview, and they would provide that in a letter explaining what it is that they need to see in order to make a decision in the case. So I've mentioned we do have these free citizenship workshops. You can sign up online using this link here. It's pretty simple, immigration.as.me slash citizenship, or you can just go to immigration.as.me and you can find it there too. That's our booking website. Uh, we do have uh, almost weekly workshops in our NorCal offices. You can choose from any of those. Um, some are in person now. Uh, many are still virtual, so depending on uh, whether you want to be in person or virtual, you can uh, take a look at what we offer there. Uh, no matter what workshop you come to, we provide the one-on-one -on -one legal review of your application and one-on-one -on -one help to get your application prepared. So it's not in a group setting. You don't need to feel that you're, you know, obviously providing information, um, you know, to a, to a group. Okay, uh, so how do you uh, start a case with us if you're wanting to get started with anything other than uh, or even with citizenship, you can click on this link here, you can give us a call or a text to this number um, to get started with the case, and I'll just pause here to see if there's uh, any questions that I can, you know, answer, you can uh, come off of mute and I'd be, I see one question in the chat about will we send the link to the presentation? Yes, we can definitely do that so that you can click all of those links in there as well. Okay. 